I was standing in my kitchen the other day and I saw, uh, well, I, I should say we have a probably unreasonable amount of bird feeders in our backyard and I've seen 39 different kinds of birds in my backyard and I looked out and I saw something that was bigger than a cardinal, smaller than a crow, but from the kitchen I couldn't quite see what it was. So we keep a pair of binoculars nearby. I grabbed the binoculars, looked through and saw that it was a brown bird. It had uh, brown flecks on its white chest and then it had like a yellow eye. And I was like, oh, it's just a brown thrasher. I should have known, right? Because I see these birds all the time. But the thing is, the binoculars allow me to zoom in and see at a level of detail something that I can't see from that distance that I'm at. But what the binoculars don't do is give me a broader field of vision. So when I'm looking through the binoculars, I might be able to see the bird, but I can't see if there's a cat sneaking across the yard to try to get to the bird. Or I can't see the squirrel that's maybe trying to get up and steal the bird's seed. But the binoculars serve that purpose for zooming in. As we read through the book of Acts, we see that the disciples of Jesus have sort of binoculars of vision that help them to navigate the world around them. If you think of that we each have a worldview, they had a worldview. Uh, they had come of age and learned a religion that had food laws and laws about circumcision and other things. And so as they encountered the risen Jesus who said, go share the story with everybody, they had a certain worldview that shaped how they tried to make meaning out of that. And then along the way, what we find in the story of Acts is that that worldview gets challenged by God's grace. And they get surprised. So last week we had the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch and surprise, the Holy Spirit sent Philip to go baptize this guy and then carried him somewhere off. This week we get to Cornelius. Uh, we, hear, we didn't hear the whole story, but Cornelius gets called to the house of a Roman centurion. And as he gets there, there's a whole group of people and he walks in and says, it's not lawful for me, a Jewish person, to be here with you. Why did you send for me? And so they say, oh, well, we sent for you because God told us to. And as he's telling them about Jesus, the Holy Spirit descends on everyone. And the other disciples that are with him, who they're called in this story, the circumcised believers, meaning they were part of the Hebrew people that came with Peter. They are astounded that the Holy Spirit has shown up with these Gentiles, meaning they were surprised. They had a vision of how Jesus was calling them into the world, and here they encountered something that was surprising to them, bigger than they expected. And as you continue to read through the book of Acts, they continue to be surprised. And sometimes that surprise is more of a challenge. There's a part uh, where they're not caring for the Greek widows as much as they are for the Hebrew widows, and somebody kind of says, hey, that's not right. And they learn that their narrow vision of who they're supposed to care for is bigger. And it's a challenge to them to now figure out how are they going to do that. So from this story and from the ongoing narrative of Acts, we learn that the binocular vision of the disciples regularly gets surprised. And that surprise is always that grace is bigger than they expected it to be. Now we as people also have binocular vision. We can only know what we know see what we have seen, experienced what we have experienced, and all of that comes together to shape our worldview. But that worldview doesn't know and see and experience everything, so we end up having sort of a narrow range of vision. I'll give you an example. I think I was about in first grade when a teacher asked a question, and I raised my hand, got called on, shared the thing that I thought was the answer, and then got picked on. So very quickly, I learned... If you volunteer information in class, you're going to get teased and you're going to draw attention to yourself that you don't want. That's my binocular vision, right? Now, just as bird watching, that binocular serves a purpose. Our worldview serves a purpose. It helps us make sense of the world. So for little first grade me, it made sense to not raise my hand anymore because getting picked on is not fun. So it was a, a defense mechanism, if you will. Now, I went through the rest of elementary school, middle school, high school, and four years of college without ever raising my hand again, because that's how you get picked on. It didn't mean a teacher didn't call on me sometimes, but I was not going to raise my hand on my own. I was 26 years old when Laura and I were at a childbirth class, 
The instructor asked the question. She put her hand up, and I said, put your hand down. <laughs> and she said, why? And I'm like, are you trying to draw attention to us? This is not, and she's like, what is wrong with you? So then I had to tell her the whole story. And then I started to realize, right, that this may be served a purpose, but if you never ask questions, your learning doesn't get deeper. You don't have an opportunity to explore and grow. So while it had served a purpose for a time, I needed to have my view expanded. So by the time I got to seminary, I did raise my hand, probably enough that some of my professors were like, that's plenty, shh. But it was, a, it was a shift and change. So we have this binocular vision, and it grows out of our limits. I don't know what it's like to not eat every day, to be that poor that you don't know where your next meal is going to come from. I don't know what it's like to be homeless and to have to spend each day not even worried about what my kids are going to eat, but where are they going to sleep. I don't know what it's like to have a, a drug cartel come to my house in my village and uh, tell my son, either come with us or we kill you. These are experiences I do not have. And there's way more that I don't understand because I have only seen what I've seen and known what I know and have experienced what I've experienced. But what we learn from this Bible text today is that when it comes to faith, while we may have some binocular vision, God's grace is very often a surprise. If it wasn't, we wouldn't need God because we could figure it all out on our own. But we know that we don't figure it out on our own and we lean into those limited sense of the world that we have. And so then God's grace comes and says, surprise, bigger than you thought it was going to be. So from this story, though, I think there are two things that we can wrestle with. One is the theological position, and the other is the practical experience of church that flows out of that. First, the theological position. Do you think God can still surprise us? Is that 100% yeses? Maybe not. Close. So if God can still surprise us, right, if grace is often a surprise and God can still do that, uh, that is actually a theological statement that says we believe the God who promised to make all things new can still make all things new. Now, if you look at church fights, whether it's an individual church or a denominational thing, whatever, often what you find is two people, two sides saying, we're right, no, we're right, and that leaves little room for surprise. But the example I want to use is the ordination of women. Still, a huge swath of the church would say women shouldn't be pastors. Our predecessor Lutheran church bodies started ordaining women only 54 years ago. Now, if I'm talking to somebody who doesn't think women should be pastors, they're going to make a whole scriptural argument of why they shouldn't be, and I would turn around and say, I don't know. Deborah was a judge in Israel before there was ever a king. Esther and Ruth did some pretty good work leading and saving the people. And then you get to the New Testament, and who were the first uh, preachers of resurrection? The women at the tomb. And when you keep reading, you find out that there's women in leadership in all kinds of ways. So I would actually argue that the Bible does support women being pastors, but let's just for a moment say that it didn't. If I'm having a conversation with somebody and they said, no way women should be pastors, and then I could say, okay, well, does God make all things new? Yes, that's the promise. Can God still surprise us? Yes. And say, okay, well, maybe God is surprising us by opening up the possibility for women to be pastors. And then they can say, no, which is what makes it a theological position, right? Right? So we're over here saying, I think God can still surprise us. God certainly surprised Philip by having him pop in on the Ethiopian eunuch, as we heard last week. God surprised Peter and all these disciples. And when the Holy Spirit showed up, Peter looks at them all and goes, well, we can't argue with the Holy Spirit, which is clearly here. It's more than we thought. It's bigger than we imagined. But why don't we go ahead and baptize these people since the Spirit is already here? And so to say that women can't be pastors is to say, well, of course, of course God could surprise Philip with grace and could surprise Peter with grace and may even surprise us with grace, just not when it comes to women doing the talking. Let's make sure that's not a surprise. And that then becomes to me an untenable theological point because what you're saying is God can't do that. And what the reality has been is just like the story. They were surprised because the Holy Spirit showed up. I have 
seen women preachers and pastors where it is clear that the Holy Spirit has shown up. And I would bet that in the late 1960s when we started talking about women being pastors in our denomination, somebody was like, seems like the Holy Spirit's already here. Maybe we should follow Peter's lead and just go ahead and go along with what God is up to. So that's the theological point, that if God really is capable of doing, making all things new, that we're probably going to get surprised sometimes, and often that surprise is going to be something that might be challenging for us. But then the practical thing is, well, what do we do with that theological thought? If the theological thought is that, yes, God can surprise us, even in ways that may make us very uncomfortable, now what? Well, not every surprise is a helpful and positive surprise. Uh, we came in here one day and water was flowing across the parking lot. Surprise, we might have a leak. That's not the kind of surprise I'm talking about. As we encounter surprises as communities of faith, I think the measure is, is this bigger and more grace than we thought? And if the answer is yes, then we should probably maybe assume that the Holy Spirit is up to something that is beyond what our binocular vision could see. My mom did not get communion until she was in probably 8th or ninth grade when she got confirmed. By the time I came around, we had figured out that maybe the Holy Spirit thought that 4th graders could understand and take communion. By the time my kids came along, my older one was 8, and he had his first communion. And then my younger one, who was 6, said, why don't I get it? And I said, because you don't understand. Why did I say that? Because I was taught that you have to understand communion if you're going to take it. At Christmas that year, as communion was unfolding, he looks at me and says, I think all kids should get bread at Christmas. I don't have an answer for that. What is it going to say? No, Jesus doesn't love you until you understand. So that's when he started taking communion. He didn't take a class. He didn't do all that stuff. He just started because, surprise, six-year-olds have some wisdom. When I first got here, I thought, it'd be cool to have a high school kid be an assisting minister. And before I could recruit one, a nine-year-old came up to me and said, can I be an assistant minister? Surprise! And you just say, is grace bigger if we open up more people's gifts being used? Yes. And it turns out if you let kids touch stuff, the church doesn't burn down. It turns out they get enthusiastic. Last week, one of our little ones came up and I gave him the wafer. And then he went and came back around for another one. (laughs) Now, I understand that... You know, a little kid doesn't, can't articulate all the rest of the stuff, but what if we all were that eager to come to communion and to engage with God's grace every single day? These are the things we learn when the Holy Spirit shows up and surprises us. So we've got the theological position that says, absolutely, God is still going to surprise us. Our stance as the church then is to say, we boldly believe what we believe expecting that maybe we're wrong and the Spirit will sometimes draw us to a bigger vision of the world. And so my prayer for us this day is that we may be blessed to continue to be surprised by God and in being surprised with God's grace can carry that with us, trusting that Jesus is the one who's doing the surprising, the one that's given us life, and the one that's going to carry that with us out into the world. Amen.